to this event where we'll discuss the state of the energy transition and how we need to speed up things because there's a lot to do before 2030. And we have a great lineup of speakers today. Uh, and uh, we have um, representatives from public and private sectors. And our focus today will be on how to actually do things. How do we get things done before 2030? Uh, all the solutions that we need to have in place. So to kick us off, we're so fortunate to have with us today um, the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon. And we know that the First Minister has been very eager and very supportive of offshore wind and of CCS. So she's actually a politician that shows us that you actually can make things happen. So with that, please, Nicola Sturgeon. Thank you very much indeed, and it's a real pleasure to be here at what I, I think is one of the most important discussions during COP uh, this week and next. The sense of urgency around here is palpable, but so too, I think, is the sense of frustration and impatience, because the hard fact of the matter is that we are not making the energy transition as fast as we need to in order to meet the targets that are essential to be blunt for the preservation of the planet and our ability to hand on a planet to future generations. So what is at stake here in Sharm El Sheikh this week and next week really couldn't be more important. We came out of Glasgow last year, uh, my home city, with 1.5 alive just and by no means guaranteed and in the year since then it is undoubtedly the case that the life support the the 1.5 commitment target uh, objective is on has had to work even harder development since glasgow have to be uh, mild about it not been helpful to maintaining the progress that we need to make Russia's invasion of Ukraine has caused and exacerbated real concerns about energy security and has, of course, contributed to, largely caused, a spike in the cost of energy. And what we are seeing from many countries, a short-term and understandable need to replace Russian gas with other supplies, really must not be allowed to become an excuse or a, a cover for extending or increasing our dependence on fossil fuels. So if the backdrop to discussions at COP26 were difficult, the backdrop to the discussions here in Egypt at COP27 are even more difficult. But the necessity of making progress, of seeing countries increase the scale of their commitment and ambition is even greater than it was in Glasgow. And so too is the need to have much greater accountability and transparency for the delivery of the commitments that are being made. On climate and on many other things, but particularly on climate, I choose to be an optimist because the alternative doesn't take us anywhere. But we can't allow optimism to be blind faith there needs to be an honesty about where we are in the energy transition and clarity of vision about where we need to be. What do we need to see? Leadership from countries everywhere, not just in setting targets, but in taking the difficult decisions to meet those targets. We need to see greater collaboration between the public and private sectors. We need to see public finance working to crowd in more private finance and we need to see governments everywhere have a clarity of vision. Scotland in a global sense is a small country but one that is endowed with wonderful renewable energy resources so we have a particular responsibility to lead by example and uh, we are indeed doing that. Over recent years we have already made significant progress in decarbonizing electricity. Uh, we are today in the position 
of having the equivalent of almost 100% of our gross electricity consumption provided by renewable sources. Uh, that's roughly a fifth of our total energy demand. Now, we import and export energy, so the reality on the ground day to day is different. But nevertheless, the capacity we have in renewables has been uh, rapidly expanded in recent years. And we have the potential to go much further yet. Uh, offshore wind was mentioned. We at the start of this year announced the outcome of a seabed licensing auction. Scott Wind, as, as we call it, we entered that auction with a, a planning assumption of giving initial consent to around 10 gigawatts of offshore energy. The outcome of the process was almost 28 gigawatts of offshore wind energy. Now, to put that in context, that is twice the amount of installed renewable capacity that we currently have in Scotland. So the potential for this is enormous. It also, of course, creates for us a massive potential to generate green hydrogen, uh, not just for domestic demand, but as an export opportunity. And our green hydrogen potential provides solutions for other countries. Germany, for example, uh, we're looking to collaborate with Lender in Germany to look at how we can provide a source of green hydrogen for them in the future. So Scotland's progress so far in the energy transition has allowed us to half our emissions from 1990. That's good progress, faster progress than any G20 country. And the potential we have is allowing us to set the most stretching targets in the UK and probably some of the most stretching targets in the world. Uh, we have an net zero target by 2045. 75, can you still hear? 70, 70, that's, better? There is nothing worse for a politician than to be silenced by a functioning microphone. So hopefully that won't happen again. Um, I was talking about our targets, net zero by 2045. The one that focuses my mind more than that is our target of a 75% reduction in emissions by 2030, uh, just eight years from now. So if we're to meet those, we need to accelerate the energy transition. And as I said at the outset, that means leadership from government, it means collaboration with the private sector, it means technological uh, advances and Scotland being prepared to be the test bed for that technological change. We need to move from electricity into decarbonising how we travel, how we heat our homes. We need to use our land mass to full extent if we are to be successful. So we are in the position of leadership but we need to challenge ourselves to go further. So these discussions in that regard are extremely important. Two final points I want to make today is the importance of seeing this challenge, not just as a challenge, but as an opportunity. It is inescapable. It is about the future of our planet. But in meeting the challenge, and the countries that move furthest, fastest, have the biggest opportunity, to reap the rewards. Scotland is a, an oil and gas producing country has been for most of my lifetime. We need to use the energy transition to create the jobs and the economic activity that will replace those currently dependent on fossil fuels. And if we do that right, we have the opportunity to create greater economic uh, advantage even than we have benefited from, from oil and gas down the last four to five decades. So let's see it as a, an opportunity, not just as a challenge. 
And my last point is about the justice of this. I've mentioned the transition in Scotland, the need to ensure that we are not leaving people or communities behind, but taking them with us. That's a responsibility for governments, but it is a responsibility for private industry too. As you invest to make profits from, to take advantage of Scotland's natural resources, it is vital that that investment is giving back to the communities uh, that those natural resources are rooted in. So the justice of the transition is vital. But that is true globally as well. Uh, we cannot simply have individual countries seeking to jealously harness all of the economic benefit from the energy transition. We must collaborate so that that is a benefit that can be shared particularly by countries in the south as they face even greater challenges than we do. So thank you for giving me the platform today. I look forward to not just these discussions today but to working with you as we make the completion of the energy transition in Scotland a reality. I'll hand back now to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, First Minister. Uh, I would li now like to invite the ex Executive Director of the International Energy Agency, Dr. Fatih Birol, to give his remarks. Thank you. So, uh, many thanks. Uh, perhaps just going from, starting from Glasgow. Uh, uh, dear colleagues, just before, uh, during and after Glasgow, many countries made pledges about uh, their net zero targets, most of them 2050, some of them 2060, some of them a bit later. And in our World Energy Outlook, we look at it. If countries would do what they said they would do, where does it bring us to? Just, very, uh, just trusting the governments, trusting the countries. It will bring us to a temperature increase of 1.7 degrees Celsius, which is not bad. Not very good, but not so bad as some of us uh, think. So from that uh, perspective, uh, Glasgow, uh, 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 Madam uh, First Minister, was a success, uh, I would say, unlike some other people uh, consider. It was a success. Maybe we didn't get everything what we wanted to get, but we got a lot of commitments uh, from uh, countries. Now, moving from uh, there, to one central issue that I want to uh, share with you, which is the following. I think this is the, uh, the biggest question in my view of the uh, day. Namely, current energy crisis is the first truly global energy crisis. Is this going to slow down It has a major transformative uh, uh, impact. It puts $400 billion cash money on the table, which will trigger a lot of private investments for offshore wind, for hydrogen, for nuclear, for carbon capture, storage, and others. In Europe, we have Repower EU. In Japan, a green transformation of Japan. China, India pushing it strongly. Why this additional? huge amount of clean energy investment coming now. For climate change reasons, no. Climate change commitment is one of the three reasons why we see 
and increase of the clean energy investment. The others are energy security, because people understand that the clean energy, offshore wind, solar, nuclear power, these are secure energy sources. Energy security and industrial policy, competition between the countries. Who will be the number one in electric cars? Is it US, Europe, or China? There, there is a race for this, and it will also bring the clean energy investment. So these three drivers, energy security, climate commitments, and industrial policy all together make a very powerful com uh, combination. As a result, I believe our world energy outlook shows that the, this current first truly global energy crisis will accelerate the clean energy transitions, bring us uh, to a better future. Is it going to be 1.5, 1.6, 1.7? We don't know. Nobody knows. But it is important to have 1.5 is the most important climate goal here. Maybe one, one final point. Africa. We should not forget that the one ton of CO2 going to atmosphere from Aberdeen or from Detroit or from Jakarta or from Johannesburg, it is the same effect on everybody. Emissions don't have a passport. So therefore, it is very important, especially for the advanced economies, to give us support on the clean energy transitions in African countries. It is important for the climate reasons, and I believe it is important for justice, as uh, 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 Madam First Minister said, uh, for a just uh, transition, and in my view, for moral reasons, it is a must uh, as well. So if you want to reach a clean energy transition, it should be just, and, uh, and utmost attention to Africa should be an integral uh, part of it. With this, uh, I would like to stop now and give it back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll now move to um, CCS and how that can contribute to the energy transition. So I would like to invite uh, CEO of Equinor, Anders Opedal, and also CEO of Valborgrum, the of Aki Carbon Capture, to, to take the stage, please. So Anders, uh, please can you give me some remarks on what you think about this topic and how to make CCS contribute to 2030. Okay, thank, you. thank you very much and uh, good to be here. Thank you very much for addressing first uh, First Minister and Fatima Roll. Uh, very viable points. Uh, some of you might uh, know Equinor, some might not, uh, but uh, we are want to be uh, a leading uh, a company in the energy transition. We focus on optimizing the oil and gas production, reducing the CO2 from uh, producing oil and gas, particularly using uh, power from solar. We want to build a profitable uh, growth in renewables. Uh, that's why we're investing in offshore wind. And the third part that we're talking about here today, we're also investing in low carbon solution, particular hydrogen and carbon capture and, and storage. And I think actually these days um, and these years, we are in at a historical turning point for CCS actually to be very, very viable. Uh, CCS is a, a technology we need. I don't know any credible scenarios to 2050 and net zero that does not uh, include uh, CCS. So why are we at a historical point now? First of all, we have worked with CCS for many, many years, working together with resource centers uh, and others. We have captured CO2 uh, for more than 27 years on the Norwegian continental shelf. We have monitored how the CO2 are progressing in the reservoir. We know it's safe. We know that the CO2 stays where it's supposed to, to stay. The second point is that uh, industries and governments have worked together to actually create real projects. Uh, the uh, long ship uh, and the Northern Light projects, which is a part of a collaboration, between uh, many companies, including Arca, but let me talk about the transportation and storage part of it, the Northern Light, where Equinor uh, is a part, together with Equinor, Shell, and Total, and the Norwegian government. We have invested in a project that can uh, use ships to pick up CO2 from different parts of Europe, bring it to the western uh, 
coastal Norway, and then pump it safely into the ground uh, outside uh, in the Norwegian continental uh, shelf. And this has actually enabled commercial deeds for transportation of CO2. So we have a, uh, a, the first, the world first commercial agreement between a commercial company, Yara, in Holland. And we will bring the CO2 from Holland to Norway and store it safely. And this is the start of a long-term value chain. And it's, uh, it's not a project on PowerPoints anymore. It's a real project uh, with real commercial uh, cus uh, cu customers. Now it's about scaling it up. And we think, uh, based on the storage capacity on the Norwegian continental shelf, uh, that we are now next project should be with such a scale that we can build pipelines from Europe to Norway. And that will take the cost down by 50 to 70 percent in terms of transportation and storage uh, the uh, CO2. And as Tati Barol also mentioned, with the ARA, uh, Inflation Reduction Act in the US, we also see that governments in the US are advocating and putting incentives in place to uh, speed up uh, the carbon capture and, and storage. And we are also working with companies in the US, Shell and US Steel, to uh, see if we can progress this technology even, even faster for us, of course, on a commercial basis, but this will enable uh, us to move faster towards a net zero uh, for uh, 2050. So now it's not about piloting anymore, now it's about scaling up, uh, but we still need the collaboration between government and industry, also in the upscaling period. That's the short version I can give you. <laughs> Thank you, Anders, and then uh, my wife is uh, thank you so much, uh, Minister, and thank you all for a very uh, interesting introduction. But most of all, to you, honors, uh, we share a long history in the energy industry, but it's just fantastic listening to you now and how you really are so enthusiastic about decarbonization. Because we started, like you said, back in 1996 on the Sleipner field. Equinor in lead as operator and Arca delivered the Sleipner platform. And what I say to everyone who finds this carbon capture and storage so difficult to understand, it's safe because it's proven on the Norwegian continental shelf. And when, when we talk about uh, the carbon capture technology itself, well, I could go into details about the aiming, blend and so on as solvent, but I won't do that. I just say one thing, it's proven. Because in Arca carbon capture, we have over 50,000 operating hours. We built our first mobile test unit in 2008. And this one has been traveling actually all over the world and tested on various flue gases. And then we built a technology center Mongstar together on us. Remember that? Yes, it was expensive, but we learned. And since then, we worked on the cost reduction and that was absolutely necessary. But like Anna said, we need commercial solutions. So uh, would you believe me if I say that we have reduced the cost of a similar plant like TCM with almost 90%. And this is the development that you've seen in solar and wind. And we can do that in CCS as well. So right now, we are delivering commercial projects. This is not something for the future. We have the long ship. And Equinor has the transportation and storage in Northern Lights together with Shell and Total. But we in Arca Carbon Capture have a contract uh, with Heidelberg Materials and Norsem, and we're capturing CO2. And this project is now in the construction phase. And there are only two carbon capture projects in the construction phase in Europe today. And we in Arca Carbon Capture are delivering both. So one of them is in Bevik, which will be in operation in 2024. And first time we will see the whole value chain in Europe. The other one is in the Netherlands, and there we have you know, the really cost uh, reduced version of the technology sent to Mongstar. We call it just catch. It's been modularized, we've had standardization, we've had digitalization, and now we're delivering a new product to Twens, a waste to energy provider. So here we are. It's proven, it's safe, and we are ready to scale. And I think, you know, we just need the support now. We need the support uh, from governments, uh, financial institutions, we need the regulation in place because the industry is ready. 
and uh, then we just move on. So, yes, let's go for it. Thank you very much, both of you. I think it's really inspiring and great to listen. But I have two small questions. One of them is to Anish. Uh, Anish, there, it sounds very good, all this, but are there any hurdles to really scale up CCS going forward to 2030? Of course, as every, every new uh, industry and every new uh, technology, there will be a hurdles. Uh, first of all, um, just kind of moving CO2 across borders, uh, that is something that, uh, you know, it's, it's considered as waste. And then uh, there is a, as a part of this uh, London protocol. Uh, and, uh, I, but I see that uh, there's a lot of work going on. We, for the project I mentioned, we have an agreement. Uh, as a special agreement in place, and this will be uh, you know, signed by all, all, all countries, so it's, it's, it's moving forward. Then, of course, it's about cost, you know, and, and this is why Valborg and myself are so eager to scale up and, and drive down the cost, because, you know, to capture, transport, and safely save uh, uh, storage uh, CO2, it, it needs to uh, kind of have a cost that is affordable, uh, as, uh, as as well, and hopefully we will be able to do that uh, below uh, the ETS price uh, in in the future. Um, it should be cheaper actually in the future to safely store CO2, capture and safely store, than actually emitting and paying. You know that's the common goal we need to uh, n need to have. But to come there, we need to scale up with many projects. And I think they need some kind of uh, support. I think Valborg's customers that needs to kind of invest in capturing will need some support to, to make sure that this technology is uh, continue developing and you know get uh, even scale up and continue decreasing the cost. And, and we need to do the same. You know, we see that uh, in the future we need a combination of pipes and, and ships sailing around. And, and how can we really lower the, the, the cost by bigger ships, you know, pipelines uh, and, uh, and, and so on. And the infrastructure that we need to put in place uh, needs to be supported um, as well, uh, and like, like we did with Northern Lights. And does it work when we have this support? Yes. As I said, uh, as soon as the Norwegian government worked together with Total Energy and Shell, this was a turning point because it becomes a real project and uh, so collaboration is key here. Thank you very much. And then Valborg, um, we've had a lot of opposition against CCS over the years and now it looks like a lot is happening, but is it happening quick enough? And then the question is why, why would we succeed with CCS business this time around? Um, first of all, uh, if you compare to where we were 10 years ago, where we really thought this industry would take off, uh, there is now a bigger understanding among everyone uh, that the climate is changing. Uh, we see flooding in Asia, we see extreme heat wave in Europe, and we see wildfires in America. So people really feel it themselves. Uh, then there is no doubt that we have been able to get the cost down in this year. So, we see that also the message that comes from so many, uh, that carbon capture and storage is part of the solution. And cement is a very good example. Here the CO2 emissions come from the process itself, mainly, uh, over 60%. And that means that the only way to decarbonize this hard to beg sector is by using CCS. Thank you very much. You want to say something? Yeah, and, and one of the reasons also I think we succeed now is that as any other technologies, we have invested in the past, we have made some failures, we had some cost overruns, we have went back to the drawing table and tried to learn from it, uh, and in that way, you know, now is the time to, you know, we have using all the learnings to really scale it up. So it's any other, you know, you try, fail, learn, and move on. Uh, we need to give those bold first mover some uh, really assistance, uh, meaning that there will be some help on the way when it comes to financing. But we will get there. There are projects today that are within the ETS of the whole value chain. We've looked into that, so it's possible. Thank you very much, and then you can sit down again. I'll have you up um, towards the end. Thank you. So now we'll move to discuss renewables and uh, hydrogen electrification. 
And I would like to invite to the stage Anne Mettler, who is the Vice President of Europe for Breakthrough Energy. And we have Romarik Roynan, uh, who is the Climate Director for Total Energy. And Philippe Kavafian, who is the Executive Director of Acre Horizons. Thank you. So first I would like to give Anne the word to say her remarks, please. Thank you so much, and uh, it's great to be talking about the energy transition this morning because one can only say that it's honestly a breathtakingly interesting time to be working uh, in energy because, I mean, very frank, changes are underway. We already heard a lot this morning. Why? And I think this is very important to understand that the war in Ukraine and Russia's weaponization of energy is really a game changer here. And I was very glad that Fatih already spoke about this. And let me actually quote Fatih. He's no longer here, but about two weeks ago, he launched the, um, the uh, World uh, Energy Outlook. And he said, and I quote, I confirm that the government responses around the world due to this energy crisis promise to be that we are seeing a turning point in the history of energy, a turning point in the history of energy. And this crisis indeed accelerates the clean energy transition. So energy security is now really a key driver. And I think we all ought to embrace that and understand that energy security and climate in many ways are two sides of the same coin. And, um, and I mean, to the extent that anyone can see a silver lining in this horrific war, it's certainly this. Um, another development I wanted to touch on here, since this is the COP that is really focused on the global south, is that there is really a major rejig underway um, when it comes to the global energy system that will bring about what I like to call new energy superpowers um, in places that have good conditions for renewables and or have the critical raw materials that we will need um, uh, for the energy transition. So places like Egypt, where we are today, but also Morocco, Chile, India, Brazil, Namibia, these are places that will become infinitely more important in my third and my last point, uh, you said that I'm Vice President for Europe at Breakthrough Energy. So let me say a word about Europe, and let me also say, when I speak about Europe, I exclude Norway, which is in a much better position than uh, the rest of, of Europe. So let me say, of course, much is underway, and, and Fatih mentioned uh, Repower EU. However, I am very worried about the very real prospect of deindustrialization in Europe. You may have seen that BASF recently announced that it will permanently drive down production in Germany. Um, I think someone already mentioned fertilizer production is down, um, steel production is down. So Europe may well be on a path of decarbonization through deindustrialization. Nobody wants that. Let me also mention that clean, emerging clean technologies, which is of course uh, what is very close to my heart, relies of course on abundant and cheap renewables, which Europe has primarily in certain geographies, such as northern Sweden or in the south, particularly in Spain. So what this means is that the notoriously slow rollout of renewables that we have seen, uh, largely due to very slow permitting processes is now not only hurting energy or electricity production, but is also hurting Europe's ability to really make progress and compete in some emerging clean technologies, if you think of uh, green steel or green cement. And I cannot uh, help but mention that the EU Delegated Act on Additionality, for those who know what this is about, has really been a stumbling block in the deployment of green hydrogen in Europe. My very last point is that the grid also needs urgent attention. As someone recently said to me, no transition without transmission. And, uh, and if I look at uh, sort of public policy responses, if I look at investment, not enough is happening uh, in, with regards to the grid, especially if we consider the very ambitious renewable targets that Europe has. So ladies and gentlemen, the energy transition is happening. It is accelerating. 
energy security is a game changer and the world that we've hitherto known is being redrawn in unimaginable ways. As I always like to say to my team, hang on to your seats. This is going to be the ride of a lifetime. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. I would like to give the word to Romerick for your uh, remarks. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. So, Romaric Roignan, I'm representing Total Energies here. So, for those who don't know Total Energies, we, are, um, we used to be an oil and gas company, and we are now transitioning to a multi-energy uh, company, providing uh, renewable energies as much as oil and gas, progressively, embracing this challenge of uh, the energy transition, because we believe, indeed, that the world will continue to need more energy, but at the same time, less emissions, and so we need to, to change the way we provide this energy to the markets in order to, to tackle the challenge. And today, clearly, I think it was uh, underlined by many uh, commentators already, but we are facing a, a daunting challenge. We have to do in uh, less than two and a half decades what we haven't been doing, the contrary of what we've been doing for the past two and a half centuries, which is uh, to grow energy availability while at the same time reducing emissions. And we have to do this at a time where uh, the capacity of the international community to um, bring um, collective and cooperative answers to the global challenges we're facing is at a, a historic low. And so it is our role we see as the private sector to really step in and uh, to take, as was mentioned earlier, some risks, test solutions, and try to uh, scale up these solutions when we see that they are working. And so in, uh, in Total Energies, we are uh, developing renewables up to, we hope, we are looking to reach 20% of our energy mix we're providing to our customers will be from coming from renewable sources by 2030. Uh, we are decreasing the share of oil in this uh, energy supply. We were uh, around 60% of oil in our energy mix in 2015, and we will be going down to 30% of uh, our energy mix by 2030. And we will increase the share of gas, of natural gas in this mix up to 50% by 2030, because we see that uh, natural gas has a crucial role in this energy transition. We can see it right now. Uh, when you can't uh, have access to gas, what you do in Europe is that you burn more coal, and this is not good for the environment. And so we, we have to, at the same time, in the short term, bring some new capacities to, uh, to bridge the, capacity, the supply gap in Europe in terms of LNG supply, and at the same time, increase our investments to have, in a few years to come, the renewable uh, production power capacity uh, that is needed to, uh, to really um, accelerate this energy transition. So that's in a nutshell what I wanted to say. Perhaps just a word also on Africa. We are in Africa for this COP. And it's true that uh, African countries are um, those with the least um, or the most people without energy access, more than 700 million people in, in, in Africa today. So uh, that's really something that needs to be addressed in the, in the coming decade as well. So to do this, we need to bring more uh, renewable energy also in, in Africa. We are investing in this country more than 100 megawatts already. Uh, but at the same time, we need to enable African countries to, to develop their uh, natural resources in order to both give access to energy to their populations and at the same time secure uh, the revenues that will enable them to invest in human capital development over the decade as well. Thank you. Thank you. And then I would like to ask um, Philip to, to give his remarks from the Arco Horizons perspective. Yes, uh, it's, a, it's a privilege to represent Arco Horizon, but I, I come from the wind industry and uh, I cannot resist to the temptation to salute our guest today because the First Minister of Scotland is uh, today with the largest floating offshore wind farm and soon Anders Opedal is going to take over with uh, the Iwin Tampen floating wind farm that is going to be built and I think floating uh, as well as green hydrogen are two very good examples of technologies that like CCS need to be now getting to the scale up to be another convincing element of the energy transition but when we look back I think we can be optimistic by experience not just by choice because we have seen the competitiveness of the renewable solution. We see that we need now 
infrastructure with grid and we need also the, the green hydrogen vector to be developed. But these things are technologies that we know how to deploy. So uh, to start with blue hydrogen and then moving to green hydrogen is a good motivation for us to build a pipeline between Norway and Germany, for example, in Europe. This doesn't need development of technology. We know we need to push development of new technologies, but the existing technology, if we scale them up, are going to be massively contributing to what we need. What we need to accelerate the energy transition, which is one mission we gave ourselves in ICA Horizon, is to interface between the industry and the massive amount of capital that is needed to finance these projects. And for that, what is really going to be important is to be capable to move from pledges to permitting, permitting giving to the supply chain the amount of investment that are needed to increase the capacity. But we know by experience that when we scale up existing solution, they are massively reducing the cost and they can contribute to the energy transition way beyond our optimistic experience. Thank you very much. Um, I would now like to invite uh, Anders and Valborg back on stage and we'll do a Q&A um, for the next 20 minutes or so. So first, I think I'll start um, with Anne. Um, what is the most important thing that needs to happen to accelerate renewables and CCS by 2030? Yeah, that uh, is a very good question uh, that I think um, many, many ask themselves. Uh, on the, honestly, on the renewables, I still believe that permitting is one of the key challenges, at least in Europe, that we face. Um, but uh, broadly speaking, renewables will, and I spoke about it in my remarks, present enormous opportunities for countries that have hitherto not been thought of as energy superpowers. So land and sun and wind are incredibly important. And this is nothing that we have uh, 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 much of in continental Europe, but that we have a lot of in other geographies. So I believe that renewables will in very profound ways really redraw the map, the global energy map. For Europe itself, unfortunately, it doesn't look that, I mean, outside of Norway, okay? Doesn't look that promising. I think offshore wind certainly is a good opportunity um, um, in, in, in parts of Europe. But as I said, if we, if we look at really abundant and cheap renewables, there's only two places right now uh, in the EU that has it. It's Northern Sweden and it is really southern Europe um, uh, where we have solar. So it really does pose um, enormous challenges. On CCS, I agree with what you said, much greater acceptance. Um, we started this job almost three years ago. Uh, this was very controversial. Uh, we are really, even in the EU, uh, this is becoming much more accepted. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't take any credit for it, but I have spoken about the need as well, because climate suffers from a collective action problem need this solution, you will not get to net zero without it. And I think a pragmatic view will realize that and we're getting to that point. So thank you for the work that you are doing and the EU is coming around here, that's all I can say. Thank you. Marik, would you like to comment on this question? Well, yes, sure. Uh, first, I perhaps I, I support everything you, you said. I would like to add that um, energy efficiency is also a very important thing. Uh, we can see today uh, when in Europe we, we don't have enough gas supply to, to, uh, to, to power uh, our generation plants. Um, what you need to do then is to find a alternative supply or to, to reduce your consumption. And so it, it's been already playing a very active role in, in the disconnection progressively of GHG emissions and the GDP growth over the past two decades. And we believe that it has really to a key role to play in the next decades to, to double the, the rate of uh, energy efficiency. We are investing in this also. We will be investing $1 billion in the two, three coming years on energy efficiency solutions to really drastically reduce the, our uh, 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 energy generation um, consumption. But So that's on, on the energy uh, um, efficiency. Then on, uh, on renewables. Uh, you've already said permitting, more investment. We support all this 100%. Uh, 
uh, policy frameworks absolutely needed. What I would like to perhaps uh, say from the investor perspective and the project um, owners, let's say, um, we will need to have also a, a investment discipline, not lose sight of that and, and, and keep control of the costs. Because historically, the, develop, the huge development of renewables over the past two decades as well has been very closely linked with a, a, a permanent reduction of costs in this industry. And if we lose sight of this, it will be more difficult to find the right projects. So uh, we, as a developer, we are very mindful of this and we, we remain committed. We will increase our investments up to six billion in the renewables over the next two, three years each year. But uh, we need to spend this money wisely on good projects and keep the costs in control. Thank you. I would like to, this is such an important question. I would like the rest of the panel to comment as well. What is the most important thing? Yeah, that I'll, I'll drop the regulations since that's already has been stated. Uh, I really like to say uh, that we need more CO2 storage. And I just can uh, ask you directly on this. We need a, a final investment decision on Northern Lights phase two right away. <laughs> Okay, good. Then on this, yeah. good comment. <laughs> yeah, good comment. And I need Paris to, to join me with Total Energy and, and Shell on that one. So we work, we're working on it. But back, back to your question. Um, um, you know, everything was said here, I, I agree to. But there's one point more I want to, to make because supply chain. You know, we cannot do anything with energy transition, build solar plants, offshore wind. Um, or CCS, uh, because this is huge industrial projects. I used to work in projects and uh, also with, uh, with, with, with Valborg, and it, it's about making sure that the whole supply chain is working, from the mining, uh, to the manufacturing, uh, steel mills, uh, etc. And we need to create a lot of jobs there. There needs also be, to be a lot of investments into the supply chain, uh, and make sure that we do all these um, you know, mining activity in a sustainable way, just transition. So we have a huge job uh, ahead ahead of us. And uh, as an engineer, I'm used to details. And, it, and you know, the challenges will be if we are not focusing on the details here, because if, we, if a project falls apart, as soon as you you lose um, one supply, you know, one uh, one pump or you know, one rare mineral or one special welding and so on. So it's about going into details. I've, I've done that a little bit also with the, um, the, um, the consenting and, and making sure that we get the regulatory in place and so on. And when I read project reports from us, I see very often the project directors, you know, they're saying that lack of federal staff to do the, uh, to do the consenting. So this is also where a lot of uh, governments need to hire more skilled people uh, to ensure that this uh, consenting goes faster. Yeah, that's very good uh, reflections, Philippe. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to add one dimension to the discussion, which is the new type of cooperation throughout the value chain. Because of course, we all now need to focus in decarbonizing, and the R to abate sectors will require either carbon capture or green hydrogen in order to reduce the emission, which is the real objective. So what we see as the real a new opportunity is to have a cluster approach, or I would say an hybrid project, if you want, which is to bridge over between the renewable energy, the green hydrogen, using it in an industrial process, like, for example, the reduction of the iron, and be able, because we have a fundamental challenge, which is the renewable energy sources are not where the factories are. To Anne's point before, we don't want to have the full European industry relocated somewhere else. So the idea is to transport the green iron or the green ammonia from renewable efficient sources to the places where the industrial process needs to be decarbonized. So this is what we do in Narvik, where we basically have abundant source of clean energy in the north of uh, Norway. And we will be able to transport out of Narvik either ammonia or green iron down to Germany. And this is, I think, the new opportunity to transport green products and not just green electrons.
I hope everybody is able to focus here. <laughs> this is the charm of, of COPS, isn't it? <laughs> so let's try to focus still, because I have some very important questions here. Um, and actually, Beluna has a CCS song. Maybe we should <laughs> finish up with that afterwards. So um, with this geopolitical tension going on between the West and Russia, um, we think some may think that the era of the growth of natural gas will come to an end. So the question um, to you, Romarik, um, what do you think of natural gas as a transition fuel? Well, th thank you. Um, as I said earlier, we, we already see a, a crucial role for gas as a transition fuel over the next period. Um, it's saddening to see that uh, with the Ukraine crisis, uh, we see more coal being uh, burned uh, in Europe and elsewhere in the world due either to availability of gas supply or uh, due to the gas prices. We can see that there is some demand destruction and this is concerning for us. But in the long run, we, we really believe that, we, uh, I mean, when we are supplying uh, Chinese uh, companies or uh, companies in Korea, we, we know that it's substituting coal uh, from, uh, for power generation to gas. When we are supplying the Caribbean, we know that it's uh, to uh, uh, energy. We know that it's uh, um, displacing some uh, heavy fuel oil for, uh, for power generation, which is not a good, uh, a good use of, uh, of, uh, of uh, heavy fuel oil. So we're, we're convinced it has to, to continue to play a role. We are aggressively developing our LNG capacity uh, portfolio, either in, on the supply side, uh, in Qatar, in um, uh, recently in the United States as well. Uh, we, we are uh, preparing our project in Mozambique and in PNG. But um, also on the regasification side, because we need to be able to bring the supply to, to Europe. And so we are investing in, the, in uh, some uh, new uh, uh, FSRUs in, in, in Europe, and we, we really see this as a absolutely crucial. Um, just a, a last point, CCS will be absolutely a, a good partner for, for, for gas. As was mentioned earlier, there is no credible 1.5 degree scenarios without massive CCS uh, use, and so we are happy to partner with Equinor and other partners on, on these projects. It's absolutely crucial, and I think there is one point on which we, we should pay attention, which is to make sure that I mean, the cost of carbon must be uh, higher than the, uh, of, uh, the cost of uh, emitting carbon must be higher than capturing it. So that's, that's correct. But we also should make sure that in the international referentials, such as the GHG protocol, um, it is uh, the, the way uh, carbon uh, emissions are counted is an incentive to, to, to use such technologies so that typically uh, you can remove uh, the emissions uh, that have been uh, captured from your scope 3 emissions if it's done by your clients. I, I, I believe that this would be a, a great incentive for, for, for such uh, the development of such technology. Also, I would like to ask Anders the same question. What do you think about gas as natural gas as a transition fuel? Yeah, as, uh, as the biggest provider of gas to Europe, you know, of course, we have a very positive view of, of, of gas in the long in the longer run. Uh, first of all, um, because we are what we are seeing now when we are lacking gas, many countries go back to coal. And that is a negative trend we need to, uh, to, to take away. And a, a gas is the, is the natural bridge uh, also to moving back, back from, uh, uh, from, from coal, in addition to renewables, uh, uh, of course. Then we have discussed a little bit of hydrogen already. Um, if we are moving into the hydrogen society, we need hydrogen at scale. I believe that uh, both blue and green hydrogen ne are needed. And uh, the first users needs to be big industrial companies. And there is no way we're going to provide green hydrogen in the volumes they need uh, in the beginning. That's why um, blue hydrogen combined with CCS uh, can be the starter, uh, particularly for kind of big steel companies, uh, et cetera, that have already made the decision to, uh, to move to, uh, to, 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 hi to hydrogen. And then, if we stop you know, looking or exploring for gas too early, 
we might not be able to kind of uh, build the necessary infrastructure based on blue hydrogen that can be lift the big projects and then naturally use the, the infrastructure to feed in green hydrogen as uh, elect electricity and more renewable electricity are, are, are made. So we just need to kind of always think about the transition from coal, natural gas to hydrogen uh, and, and green hydrogen uh, in the end. Thank you. Um, I have another question to um, uh, Total Energy and Equinor. And uh, if we look at uh, getting on track with the IA's net zero um, scenario, um, will require a tripling of investments in renewables and CCS. So shouldn't we be channeling some of the extra revenues that you've had? I think it's like two billion US dollars extra since if you compare to last year for the oil and gas uh, sector. So what can you say about using some of that and really make sure that we can triple the investments by 2030? Well, first there is a first message about uh, the notion of windfall. We, it's true we are making a, a lot of uh, revenues this year, a lot of cash, uh, but it's, n I mean, we are making much more uh, revenue than 10 years before when the prices were at the same level. So what does it mean? It means that we have been working, uh, um, putting ourselves to work to reduce our costs and so increase uh, the, or to, to, to lower the break even of our activities. And, and it didn't happen uh, overnight uh, or by itself. It's, it's the fruit of all the teams working together uh, with the suppliers, with the, the vendors and so on to, to reduce the costs of providing this energy. So that's the first thing. But then we are fa have been blessed in a way with this, uh, with this, uh, this cash, these revenues. Of course, we are facing a lot of contradictory messages from uh, investors, they want their money back. Uh, the governments, they want in need uh, more, um, more taxes in order to first perhaps to not to invest in energy transition, but also to shield the consumers from the hike in the price. And that's what we are seeing in, in Europe typically. Um, and then, so we and then we need to to, to invest in more uh, in more supply for the to, to face the the, uh, the the supply shock that we're facing in Europe. So that's also one one need for for the for this cash. And finally, we need to not to lose sight of the energy transition and to invest right now the money that will help us uh, provide this renewable electricity in uh, just a few years to come. So. With this, you have to ask yourself who is best place to invest. Um, we believe we have a, a, a good uh, case to make as investors, having both indeed the, uh, the financial resource and the technical capacity, the team that can deliver the projects. And so we, we want to do this. And so we have increased uh, our uh, investment guide, our CapEx guidance for investors uh, from 2022 to 2026. Uh, to, to, to devote 33% of our investments to renewables, which is, I believe, unprecedented in, in our history as a company. Um, and we have increased the, the level of CapEx as well. So not only the share that will be devoted to, to, uh, to, to, to renewables, but also we have increased the pool that will be devoted. So up to 6 billion per year in the next uh, two, five, uh, three, four years. So we, we hope it will be a significant uh, contribution. Our aim is to, to have 100 gigawatts capacity by 2030 so to be in the top five of renewable producers so so we think that's quite material thank you and Anush, would you like to answer that a bit uh, challenging question yeah thank you I, I actually get that question quite quite a lot uh, and it's, it's clearly um, you know a dilemma but uh, but we are investing in the future um, we, we put forward our strategy last year and uh, based on um, what we saw is necessary at that point in time of renewable projects and low carbon project. We said we will invest 23 billion US dollar in renewables and low carbon solutions from 2021 to 2026 and the same amount for 26 to 2030. So basically we already committed to uh, our, our, a tremendous growth uh, in our portfolio and now we're, what we're actually working on is to execute on these projects, take away uh, the bottleneck no, but uh, so, 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 so this is so this is what we we have uh, been 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 doing. Uh, now we of course have uh, extra uh, income 
some of it goes to tax, I have to say, you know, with 78% tax rate in Norway and windfall tax in, in UK, that's fine. Uh, this is about redistributing wealth, that's the role of, uh, of, of government. But I can show you the best thing we can with the, uh, the revenues is to invest in the future, invest in profitable projects uh, for our investors. And we have developed our energy transition plan, demonstrating how we're going to transform the company and we get the 97% approval rate at the AGM. So the, clearly the direction uh, of investing in renewables, low carbon solution, are also supported by our investors. Thank you, that's good to hear. So I have a question to Anne and Philippe, perhaps. Um, energy, energy shocks have caused uh, nations to turn inwards and to focus on their own energy supplies. And at this international um, community coming together here at COP, it seems like things have changed since last COP, that we're now more less of a cooperative spirit. So how can the private sector uh, ensure that we change that picture what role do you see that you can play so that we can get, ensure that we do collaborate more in the coming years? I mean, what you describe is a real issue, um, uh, namely a crisis of multilateralism. There is a lot of competition and distrust in the world right now. I recently came across an interesting word, cooperation, so cooperation and competition, which can actually be quite helpful. So we know uh, that certain geographies will have to work together, such as the United States and China, in addressing the climate uh, challenge. However, Fatih Birol said it earlier, there is also an understanding now that the next generation of clean technologies is essentially a race and for industrial success in the future. And this would be one comment that I have around the investment challenge that is being discussed here. We need to make sure that not everything goes into mature technologies. There is a new generation of clean technologies, uh, be it long duration energy storage, uh, be it uh, uh, sustainable fuels for aviation, for shipping, uh, be it CCUS. I mean, th these are not mature technologies yet. They still need a lot of investment, and I am very concerned that uh, there isn't enough of a breakthrough spirit in the world. If I compare it, for instance, to the beginning of the pandemic, when the world came together and said, we need to produce a vaccine in record time. Now we have a war, we have a climate crisis. The world is in very dire state. How are we coming together to say we're going to have these energy breakthroughs because energy is being weaponized as we speak? I am missing that. I am missing the focus on the next generation. I am missing the investment on real sort of energy moonshots that may well be needed. So for that, maybe the co-opetition may actually be helpful, if I can say that. So this is a very different world just from one year ago in Glasgow. So I think all of us will know more at the end of this COP where the world stands. But let me say also this, everyone in this room, and especially here, has an important role to play. That is very clear. And I think the one thing that I sense is that oil and gas companies coming here are received differently maybe than in previous COPs. Correct me if I'm wrong. Even invited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, even invited. Even invited, yes. Yeah, that's good to hear. Philip? Yeah, I think the, the, the answer to your question is that the country level is not the right answer. It has to be a regional. So, you know, having, I'm from France, I'm in Norway, so I include Norway in Europe, uh, geographically, but also because the real approach to clean energy and decarbonization needs to be regional. So it's more interesting to look at it from the North Sea perspective or the Mediterranean perspective or the Baltic Sea perspective and all the countries around this uh, water basin needs to have the infrastructure to connect the clean energy sources with the needs of decarbonized uh, energy or molecules. And I think that's where the, the secret for moving out of the current, uh, I would say, backward trend, where the lack of coordination, particularly in Europe, I mean, we, everyone knows that probably a better coordination between France and Germany energy policy would have been suitable earlier than 
triggered by the war. But what we know is that moving forward, we, we need to have solutions that are going to be solutions for all the neighboring countries around clusters. And I think both for, from a technology point of view, we see power utilities, oil and gas companies working now in common projects. We see technology like renewable generation, green hydrogen, chemical processes that are going to also need to be bridged over. This type of new cooperation are going to be the solution. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're, we're out of time, unfortunately. I think we could go on with this for another two hours. But uh, what a great panel. Thank you very much, all of you. And please give a hand to the panel. Thank you very much. <laughs>